Welcome, Tim Bits from Thailand. It's a rainy morning. It was raining when I got up, but just now stopped raining. It rained just enough to put enough cold water into the pool that's gonna make the pool cold. I've got some stories to tell. I also want to talk a little bit about pre-retirement. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Boeing, if I remember, and all this news stories on Boeing. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the, uh, the news that was in the news today about the National Association of Realtors. I've got a lot of friends who are realtors. They may not like what I have to say. But before we get started, please tickle that like button just a little bit and try to watch towards the end. Nothing's worse for getting your video promoted than you guys say this video sucks. If it does, I apologize. But uh, maybe you have to go to the bathroom. Just let the video run while you go. That would be good for me. All right. Oh well, let's get on to some story telling here. Or let's talk about a couple of things. First thing I want to talk about is all the Boeing news. Every time a Boeing plane has an issue, it's headline news and somebody wants to give Boeing another black eye and they pile it on. Well, for those of you who don't know it, uh, I started flying myself in the 1980s. I quickly obtained lots of certificates, including multi-engine, instrument, commercial, a glider rating, an airbag sign off. Uh, spent a ton of time. My first plane within a year was a twin engine, Seneca 2. And within a year, I traded up to a cabin class pressurized Cessna 421 C model called a Golden Eagle. Now, this plane could fly up as high as 25,000 feet, and uh, it typically liked to fly around 18, 19,000 feet. That's, it was real comfortable f f getting to 18 or 19,000 feet. So, for a period of my life, I spent a ton of time learning and living in everything aviation. I was just absorbed with it. Yeah, you know, I, would, I would be fortunate enough that I would call up my friend and say, hey, let's fly to Atlanta from Cincinnati and grab ourselves a $800 cheeseburger. And we would do that stupid stuff. I used to fly every single weekend uh, at the time, I had tickets for every single NASCAR race east of the Mississippi. And I would take a group of guys, a different group of guys, almost every week. Most people couldn't afford to go every week. But I had a group of a bunch of guys who loved NASCAR. We'd all jump in the plane about 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. Depends how far the race was away. And we would fly out to the track, watch a race, jump in the plane and fly back all on a Sunday. And that was a lot of fun and I did a lot of flying. Well, I bring this up because as a pilot, it seems like the mainstream media wants to exaggerate every single little thing that happens to a plane if it has Boeing on the side of it. 
If it's a Boeing 737, it has the slightest little thing. Well, they want to make a big deal about it. Uh, a panel came off of one of the Boeings just yesterday. Uh, they said it landed without incident because a panel came off. Well, there's a lot of small panels and large panels, nacelle work, cover-up panels, where a couple, couple of the Zeus fasteners is what they used to call them, uh, would come loose and fall off. Uh, all planes have all these little issues. Little issues. Yeah. Now the other day, a Boeing plane, I know you probably saw it on the news if you watched the news, it had tire fall off on takeoff. As it's climbing out from, from the airport, this tire fell off and fell down and hit some cars and tore the hell out of some cars and a fence. And they're making a huge deal about, you know, oh, it's Boeing's, you know, it's a Boeing. It's, it's bad. It's, it's Boeing. Well, my bet is somebody who did the maintenance didn't tighten the bolts well enough. That's just my bet. Now, when that door plug blew out of Alaska Airlines and they showed a picture of the actual door plug on the ground, I saw there was nothing ripped on the door plug. It didn't look like it was torn loose. It didn't take me three weeks to figure out that somebody never put the bolts in the door plug. I mean, it was instantaneous in my mind. You looked around the frame of the door inside. There was no bending of the frame. It was just like it just was gone. Well, that's Boeing's fault. Somebody should have put the bolts on on that door plug. I mean, that you would think that that would be a absolute 100% requirement. But they want to make a big deal about it for Boeing. It's not a big deal. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, you've got Boeing who has thousands of commercial planes in the air every day doing tens of thousands of flights every day around the world. Some little shit's going to happen. So if you fly on airplanes and you listen to the news, you're going to make a big deal about, you know, all Boeings aren't as safe as Airbus. Baloney. It's just pick on Boeing Day in the press because they need to get eyeballs on what they are saying. And the political race right now is so dull, they got nothing to say about it. They're trying to back Biden. They can't come up with anything good to say about that. They hate Trump and they're running out of bad things to say about Trump. So they have to pick on something. Boeing's on the list. That's all I wanted to say about that next topic. Next topic is the National Association of Realtors lost a big lawsuit that was brought by someone, I think, in Missouri that alleged that for years the National Association of Realtors has conspired to keep real estate commissions for realtors higher by compelling the seller of a property to pay for the buyer's agent. So if you went out and bought a piece of property and you had an agent for you, it always came out of the buyer's commission. The, the Selling agent and the, the selling and the listing agent is what they're called. And the buyer's agent all got to split that commission. And that was standard practice. So if you wanted to sell your house, the realtor would, would say five, five and a half, six percent, whatever you negotiated, whatever the market would bear. And 
time you closed your house, you'd have to pay them that commission. They split with the, with the buying agent, with the buyer's own agent. If the buyer didn't have an agent and bought it on their own, they kept it all. Didn't get any cheaper. So a lawsuit said, if a buyer wants an agent, let the buyer pay for the agent. Let the buyer tell the agent, I will pay you X percent of the purchase price. And don't make the seller of the house have to pay for the buyer's agent. To me, that makes a whole lot of sense. And just today on CNBC, I saw one of these million dollar agents from LA that's on TV all the time arguing with somebody else saying that all this practice is right. Make the person pay. I always hated that whenever I sold property that I had to pay their percentage and if you wanted on the MLS, you had to go with a realtor and pay those kind of percentages. You couldn't be on the MLS otherwise. Well, I think that's getting changed too. Where you'll be able to get on the MLS for a lot less money and you'll be able to say, I'll pay my selling agent and I'll negotiate with them. But if the buyer brings an agent, that's the buyer's responsibility to pay, not mine. Now, the buyer might come to the seller and say, you're going to pay for my agent out of your proceeds. That's part of the deal. That's okay. And if the seller says, yeah, I want to sell my, my property, I'll pay for your, your agent that represented you as the buyer, I'll pay out of my proceeds. That's okay. But let's negotiate not just that's the way it's done in the National Association of Realtors, which, let's face it, every realtor in the United States seems to be a member. It's one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the United States. Uh, they lobby the politicians, and it's a strong lobby. So I'm a little happy about it. Now, I know my, my friends who are realtors are probably not happy about it. Uh, but most, most of the time, I, I, I resented it. I resented having to pay for the buyer's agents. Tell me what you think in the comments below. All right, storytelling. On my channels, I get a lot of comments about you retired, sold everything, moved out of the United States, found a, a place you like to live in better. And how did you come to do that? And how did you do it? Well, I want to talk about property, which ties into the real estate thing. If you're getting ready to retire in a few years, if you're one of the people who say, hey, I've got four or five more years left, your property in the United States, if you own your own home, for the most part, unless you've got a home in a primo location. You know, unless you're living on the beach somewhere in Miami or living on the beach in Naples or Bonita Springs or somewhere that's just, you know, the home prices are appreciating at a tremendous rate where a lot of places aren't. I contend your home is a is a horrible property for you to own at this point. As the economy goes further, the U.S. dollar is, is being debased more and more. And most people say, well, I don't want to sell my house because Either my house is paid for or 
I've got such a low interest loan on my house. Where am I going to buy another house? I, can, I don't want to get a 8% loan or a 7.5% loan to buy a new house. So I can't sell my house. So how much is your house going to go up in the next five years? 20%? 10%? Could even go down if we go into a recession or depression, a cyclical depression. It could go down. But regardless whether it goes down, the U.S. national debt is increasing at approximately $1 trillion every 100 days. And they're debasing the currency by issuing more and more U.S. Treasury bonds. So holding that U.S. piece of property right now is not really the smartest way to handle things. Owning property is, but maybe not your house. Now, I know I'm a broken record on this, but listen to me out a little bit. Bitcoin is not a currency. Bitcoin is property. It is the most liquid, hard property that you can have. And you can take it across borders in seconds. You can put it in your luggage. You can take it with you. And it's been the best performing property as far as returns for the last five years, 10 years, 15 years. You picked a period. It actually is higher every year except for two in the last 15 years. No person who's ever purchased Bitcoin and held it for four years is losing money. They're all making money, and a lot of it. Tens of thousands of percent. So, if you're looking to retire, why not sell that home put some of that proceeds in the property called Bitcoin, which has been very successful, and just renting. Liquidate what you don't need, downsize into a rental. You say you want to retire, you say you want to travel, that's, that's a typical thing that people say when they retire. They say, I want to travel. I want to retire and I want to travel. Well, while you travel, do you want to have to support that house with all the expensive insurance and expensive taxes and expensive maintenance? You go travel, the grass still got to get cut, so you hire somebody to do that. Snow needs shoveling. Roofs need repairing. Plumbing needs repairing. You want to deal with all that? If you want to travel and you're renting, you can travel and you can just rent or you can downsize and rent. And in the meantime, you put that money in Bitcoin. Let's say that you knew you were going to want to retire in 2024 and in 2021, you decide... I'm going to try to sell my house. Now, did Mark do this? No, I didn't. I uh, took me 18 months of working to sell everything I had of value and to get out of the chains that were binding me. It took 18 months. It takes time. So if you got two or three, four years before you want to retire, five years, you might say, hey, 
We can sell our house now before it gets worse. Because let me tell you, if interest rates go up, now I know everybody's saying, oh, the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed's going to cut rates. Well, if you've been listening to CNBC this week, the CPI and the CPE all came in way with more inflation than was expected. Now, they're all saying, oh, you know, the rate of inflation is decreasing. Eh, it isn't nine, it might not be as high as it was a year ago as far as month over month, but it isn't like prices are getting less expensive. They're just going up at a slower rate than they did before. And if the Fed cuts interest rates, they're going to, Prices are going to go up again. More money in the system, more liquidity, higher prices. That's just the way it always has been. So you might want to think about renting until you actually retire. If you're one of the ones who says, I want to retire and I want to travel, I want to go places, I want to do things. I don't want to stay here in Milwaukee anymore where it gets cold in the winter time. I, I won't have to go to work at my job here in Milwaukee. So I want to travel. Well, you want to go to Florida? Rent a place in Florida. You want to go to Texas? Rent a place in Texas. You want to go to Nashville? Rent a place in Nashville. You want to go to... Belize, Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica. You want to travel through Latin America? You want to go try your hand at living on the French Riviera? Get yourself a little villa there in, in the south of France? All that's available to you, all of it. But it'll be much harder to do if you still have the chains of property that can't be moved. Bitcoin is property that can move. Now, all I can say is start keeping track of it. It goes up, it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. It just last week, just this week, it hit a high of seventy-three thousand six hundred dollars. And then it dropped down at around $67,000. And now it's back up to around $70,000. And it'll zig and zag. But here's the thing. Bitcoin now has the blessing of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the form of spot ETFs, 11 of them. These spot ETFs make it far less likely that any regulatory hurdles are going to come over Bitcoin because you got people like BlackRock, you got major corporations, you've got pension funds from from states and you got universities like Stanford University just allocated I think was it 7 or 15% of their uh money that they have in their endowment to Bitcoin because it performed so well. I didn't have that four years ago. This only came in January. But that alone makes it far more secure. Also, if you do decide to get Bitcoin, there are now multiple ways to hold your Bitcoin to ensure it doesn't get stolen or lost. You can go to Fidelity Digital Assets and let Fidelity hold it. I know, not your keys, not your coin. Well, don't let them hold it all, but they can hold some. You can go to... Uh, get a vault from 
one of the major Bitcoin suppliers that uses multi-signatures to get at the money once you put it in. You need two signatures on two electronic devices and that makes it far harder for anybody to ever mess with. And you're actually storing your own keys, but you've got more than one signature required. So even if somebody put a gun to your head by yourself, you couldn't, you couldn't give them your money. You can, you can take your IRAs and your rollover IRAs, your 401ks, and those might be in Fidelity or they might be in Charles Schwab or some other major brokerage house. You can buy the Bitcoin ETFs and let them custody it in Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's up over 100% in the last six months. I mean, granted, it goes down but you can dollar cost average into it. And I did, I'm still doing it. You know, buy a little every day. Buy, buy some, wait for a pullback, buy more. And while you've been waiting for that pullback, buy a little every day. And keep getting your money into a property that's going to appreciate far more than your house. And that property appreciates, by the way, without property taxes that you have to pay every year, even if you keep your property. You don't have to fix the roof. You don't have plumbing leaks. You don't have septic systems that break down and need to be replaced. You don't have to pay for insurance, fire insurance, hazard insurance. You don't run the risk of an act of God destroying the property and being something not covered in insurance. So it's just an idea. It's something to think about. But Regardless of what you want to do with your money, I mean, you could sell your house and rent and put your money in the bank. Put it in money markets. Put it in a money market fund. There's a name for people who put their money in keep their money in fiat and put it in a bank or put it in a money market. They're called poor because they give you 5% and the currency's worth less than it was because they debase the currency which basically means they're printing their way out of, out of the debt they're carrying. I mean, you know, what a dollar we would have bought a hundred years ago probably takes a hundred dollars to buy today. It's that bad. It's literally that bad. I mean, it's lost 99% of its purchasing power since the Federal Reserve came in and started with this 2%. Yeah, 2%. We want 2% inflation. That's their goal. Well, I did other videos on my channels about 2% inflation. But basically, just think of it as they want 2% of your money every year. It's seriously just robbing the middle class of 2% of their money every year. Now, the rich are getting richer because they put everything they got into investments that pay off big. 
And the richer they are, the, the more access they have to investments that pay huge, not just the ordinary put in the stock market. But remember, the stock market's no, uh, no, no piece of cake with a ice cream and cherry on top. I lived through the 1999-2000 high-tech bubble. I was using the internet in my business in 1995. I had a, my own websites. I was selling data online. I knew about all the big companies. Companies like Cisco, who was the thing. They were the AI. They were powering the internet. They were, they were the cat's meow. Their stock price was so high, and when 2000 come, it dropped like a rock. What did they lose? 95% of their value? Now, some other companies did too, like Amazon. Well, it recovered. But Cisco's never gotten back to the high it was. Never. So if you had put all your money in the stock market in 2000, and you happen to put it in the wrong stocks, you may still, even if you kept it, you never sold. You may still be trying to even get even from 24 years ago. So putting your money in the stock market, you have to stay on top of everything, and it can drop quick. And then, Let's say you see it's dropping. It's dropped 5%. And you say, I'm going to get my money out of the stock market. Where are you going to put it in? Cash? You're going to put it in fiat currency? It's not worth the paper it's written on? It's devalued so much? You're going to stick it in treasury notes where they're going to give you 5%, but you're going to lose another 10, 10 or 12% on your money on top? Maybe you lose 15% a year if you put it in treasury notes. It doesn't preserve wealth. Bitcoin's property. Let me ask you this. If I gave you a billion dollars and dropped you in, in Africa and said, here's a billion dollars, what are you going to do to preserve this wealth for the next 100 years? What are you going to buy for a billion dollars in Africa that's going to preserve this wealth for the next hundred years? Guaranteed. Nothing. Bitcoin. Because it's a finite asset, there'll only be 21 million coins in it. But it's, it's a secure form of property. It's not currency. It's not for transactions. It never will be. The people who bought property on Fifth Avenue 70 years ago, it appreciated because it was in a really good place. But those owners don't think about they're going to take a small slice of their property and go buy a cup of coffee with it. That's not, that's not what property's for. The richest people in the world all have property, hard property. And the smartest ones have property that's so valuable. You know, they're down in Palm Beach, Florida. They have one and a half, two acre lots. They're being sold for $200 million. There's no house on them. Just 200 million for an acre or two because they're on the beach in a prime location. They didn't cost 200 million 10 or 20 years ago. If you buy the primest of prime property, you can make some money on it. But remember, they did pay taxes on all the time they owned it too. And the taxes down there are not cheap. But that's my thought about retiring early and actually not keeping your home. Downsizing it, selling it now while you can sell it. 
and getting a rental so that when you do get that final check from your employer and you're ready to retire, you got nothing holding you back. You want to travel to Italy? Ever dream of going and seeing where your relatives came from in Ireland? Go. You don't have a house. You don't have something you have to get rid of. I say, owning a home, I'll be honest, the home I had in Cincinnati, remember I was born and raised in Cincinnati, the home I had in Cincinnati didn't make me a lot of money. I owned it for a very long time, I didn't make a lot of money on it. Why? <laughs> because it's in Cincinnati. When's the last time you ever heard anybody saying, I'm retiring, I'm going to Cincinnati? If you hear anybody says, tell you that they're moving to Cincinnati, it's probably because they got a job with some company that required them to go to Cincinnati for one reason or the other. I mean, I don't know of anybody who says, man, it's my dream to go to Cincinnati. You know? Yeah, Cincinnati's got the Bengals, it's got the Reds. It's got an opera house. You know, a good symphony orchestra. It's got lots of museums. Cincinnati's not a, a terrible city. It has a little less crime than some, but it's by far not a safe place. When I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, I never left the house without a gun in my pocket. I didn't carry a holster outside of my belt. I carried a holster in my pocket. I just bought pants with a big enough pocket to keep a gun in. I never left home with that. Why? Because, hell, you could drive a mile in the, in the local, you know, grocery store get held up or a local bakery or you know they try to rob somebody on the sidewalk I mean the place was not safe it's amazing but it used to be when I grew up there I grew up my house was less than less than a quarter mile half mile maybe maybe a little less than a half mile from where I grew up. It was a safe place in 1962. Not anymore. I mean, I have no fear whatsoever in Thailand. Do they have crime? Yeah, but nothing like they have in, in the United States. Not with, not with the frequency I mean, more people are sh will be shot in Chicago this weekend than probably will get shot in all of Bangkok for a whole year. Maybe two, I don't know. But it's just very, very low crime rate here. And it's not gang crime. It's not people just driving around shooting people at random. Around here, most of the crime seems to revolve around relationships of one sort. Uh, somebody got a problem with the relationship and unfortunately alcohol seems to be involved way too much which is why I had the video the other day about being lonely and turning a bottle here is is really bad. It'll bust you here. And that's why these guys who live in very small condos here, 23 square meters, you know, real small spaces, they don't want to sit at home. What are they going to do at home? You can only look out your, your window to the ocean and see the ocean a half mile away so long before you want to go out and you, you say okay I'll get something to eat and I'll sit at the bar 
So for those of you who are retiring, I gave you some food for thoughts, a little tidbits from Thailand. That's all, folks.